If you have your Bibles open to Proverbs chapter number 23 as we begin tonight and uh, continue back in our study on alcohol and the Christian. Alcohol and the Christian. Interesting study for us. I know that some of you here or online will not agree with me when I'm all done. All right? Some of you will say, you know what, Pastor, I'm going to drink alcohol. All right? And my challenge to you is, if you do that, just do it because of what God says in His Word and do it to the glory of God. Because my Bible says, whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. What Paul is saying is that everything that we do ought to magnify and glorify our God. I believe one of the reasons he puts eating and drinking is there is because that is a mundane task. Each one of us today will eat something and drink something even if we're on a diet. All right? And so even in the mundane tasks, those ought to glorify God, our God in heaven. So if you completely disagree with me, we're all said and done, that's fine. Just do it because God told you to and do it to his honor and to his glory. I believe you'll be hard pressed to do that. But we're going to look at God's word again as we open up this concept. There is a, there is a lot of debate out there. A lot of debate out there. And uh, like I mentioned, I've looked at, uh, in the process, different blogs, different things, and, and boy, people are all over the sun. I recently heard a message on this topic, and the, some of the truths were excellent truths from God, God's Word, truths that I will present. But the spirit of what I heard was not like I'm trying to portray through this time. Um, statements like this, anybody can see what I'm trying to tell you. If you don't see this, you're an idiot. Right, honey? My wife was with me. You're an idiot. Now, that's not helpful, is it now? That's not helpful. All right? And, and uh, so if, if it takes, as you look through, it takes a little while to get to it. I don't think you're an idiot. I don't think you're a fool. I want to bring God's Word. And I hope in all of this, in all of these studies, that you go to God's Word. And you say, God, show me from your Word. All right, not just because pastor said so, uh, but, but because your word says it. And get in, there, get in God's word and study it and look at it. Most people do not study God's word. All right, um, I'm, I'd like you to read it, but the Bible challenges us to study God's word. In fact, after, uh, was it the past week, Johnny came to me and he said, Daddy, I think next year I want to do some studies in God's word. I said, that's great. And so we're working on that already. Y'all don't want to study God's word. That's a good thing. So we're going to pray, ask God's blessing and help tonight. And, and uh, see what he can help us tonight. Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for watching over us. Thank you for your compassion, your grace. Lord, that in, as we're yet sinners, you died for us. And Lord, I pray tonight there's someone here or in the sound of my voice online who's never trusted you as your Savior. Lord, that they would understand that they're sinners, but that you died for them. And Lord, they trust you. Lord, I thank you for your grace. Lord, I pray for this time as we look at this topic in these verses on alcohol in the, in the Scripture. Lord, that you would help our hearts to be tender to your Spirit. Lord, that your word would teach us and show us and guide us. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. I am presenting, I am arguing this fact, I am not ashamed of the fact that I believe that the God teaches, the Bible teaches, the Christian should avoid alcohol as a drink. Okay? That means you shouldn't have it in your house to avoid alcohol. And uh, you shouldn't buy it from the store. I remember a long time ago, I'm a, I'll tell you something now, you're like, oh, is he buy alcohol? No, no, I bought one of those uh, sparkling, uh, sparkling cider things. I don't know, it was with my sister's 21st birthday. So I bought one of these little sparkling things, and I was in college at the time. And uh, when they sold it to me, they actually sold it to me in a brown bag. All right? And wouldn't you know it, nothing wrong with that, all right? We've had sparkling, great grape juice, but wouldn't you know it, right as I'm checking out, there was my Bible teacher. It was Dr. Mark Minnick. Uh, <laughs> he's a very austere Bible teacher, and he was right there in line in front of me at the store. And so there I'm trying to hide this thing in a brown bag. It looks just like it shouldn't look. And, and so I got it back to the, to the campus there. It was my sister's 21st birthday party. And I don't know what happened with this particular bottle of sparkling grape juice or not, but um, as we opened it for her, the lid blew off the top. And uh, it shot out, all right? Apparently it shoots out like, I don't know, like champagne. I've, I've never opened champagne, but apparently it shot all over the place. And it wasn't the next week that there was an announcement made for, for another new rule. They said, uh, students, please do not bring sparkling uh, grape juice onto campus. And uh, so um, I'm not talking about that, though, all right? <laughs> that, 
Um, but that we ought to avoid it. The Bible teaches us to avoid it, right? This is not just because it'll be helpful in your life, though I believe it to be helpful in your life. All right, I have not approached this yet, though I'll bring some data about this at the end from a purely logical, humanistic standpoint. All right, we could spend a whole night talking about the effects of alcohol on marriages, on homes, on lives, on driving, and how much they have ruined people's careers, lives, homes, ability to move, all of that. But I'm putting that aside right now. Right now we're looking at God's Word. We'll save that for the very end, all right, because it just makes good sense. All right, but right now we're looking at God's Word, and I, and I believe the Bible teaches us that we ought to avoid this. Why do I think that? Well, there is, uh, there is a principle in Scripture that I think we find it, uh, first off, in Romans, or, sorry, Romans, Proverbs chapter 23. Looking in verse number 29 where the Bible says, Who hath woe, who hath sorrow, who hath contentions, who hath babbling, who hath wounds without cause, who hath redness of eyes? All right, this person is obviously in distress. This person obviously has some problems. So who has all these things? And then the Bible goes on to tell us in verse 30, they that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine. Now, if the Bible stopped right there, that would give us some truth. And we'd say, okay, well, we can't follow the mixed wine and we don't want to tarry long at the wine. And that's definitely included. But the Bible doesn't stop there, does it? The Bible goes on a little bit further. The Bible is incredibly helpful in your life, just so you know. And it's helpful in my life if we study and look at it. He goes on in verse number 31 to say this, Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. Now, a lot of interpretation about that particular verse right there. When it says, when it, uh, when it is red, there is some thought that that is when it's fermented. Others think it's when it causes someone to become flushed. All right? You may not realize this, but by drinking grape juice, your nose doesn't turn red. Okay? Um, there's some interpretation. It could mean either one, and either one would bring us to the same conclusion that a fermented beverage ought to not, I shouldn't even look upon it. Look upon it. So you're like, aha, pastor, I can drink it if I close my eyes. <laughs> well, don't be silly. At last, verse 32, at the last, it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. He goes on to describe what is the effect of this, which, uh, which brings us to the conclusion that he's obviously talking about a fermented beverage because of the effects of it. Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. Well, we know that when someone becomes intoxicated, by this wine that he just mentioned two verses, two verses back, that often their lips are loosed, right? One of the side effects of someone who is drunk, they say things they shouldn't say. Another side effect uh, is that they end up being immoral upon strange women. Proverbs often deals with a strange woman or immoral relationships. And often, or, so, or when someone becomes drunk, their morals are lowered. Right? Their inhibitions are removed. So obviously this is talking about some type of fermented beverage. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. So their movement is now hindered. Why do you think the police officer asks you? Walk this straight line. Right? The Bible is describing what's happening. Is, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. Isn't that interesting? You get kind of woozy. Like you got vertigo. But it's brought on by this beverage. The Bible calls wine here. In verse 35, they have stricken me. They, they shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. So after all these things, after these woe and these contentions and these problems with immorality and problems with uttering all these things and feeling sick and having wounds without cause and feeling beat up and all this, then it's addictive. Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist really to kind of figure out what this is referring to, right? It says wine and mixed wine or mixed, uh, mixed, a mixed drink there. So the Bible teaches us to avoid it. We're going to kind of just kind of catch up again where we're at. There are the, there's the principle of this. So the principle is we're, we're to avoid it. Proverbs 23, verse 20, uh, a few verses back from that same chapter, the Bible says, Be not among wine bibbers among riotous eaters of flesh. 
So I'm to avoid those who become drunk or who drink like that. I'm to avoid this. The Bible principle, the scripture clearly communicates negativity. The Bible says in verse number 1 of Proverbs chapter 20, just a page back in my Bible, that wine is a mocker. Wine is a mocker and strong drink is raging and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. One of the major emphasis, one of the major points of Proverbs is for you and I to seek wisdom. It tells, uh, Solomon comes out and says, my son, seek after wisdom. Seek after it like a hid treasure. And one of the major themes throughout Proverbs is wisdom and the act of seeking wisdom and following wisdom and the folly in ignoring wisdom. The fool is the opposite of a wise man in the book of Proverbs. And the fool, in many ways, has shown their destruction and, and shown what happens. And so we're, we are taught to seek wisdom. And here, uh, Solomon tells us that wine is a mocker. And if I'm deceived by wine, I will not be wise. How do I get deceived by wine? How does that happen? Is it, well, pastor, you're deceived after you drink Four bottles of it. Is that the point I'm deceived by it? Or could it be? Could it be that I would be deceived in arguing for this? Could it be that I'd be deceived in thinking that this would be helpful to my life? Could it be that the deception comes not from the consumption, but from me believing that this consumption is going to benefit me? Why do people drink wine? I looked at today uh, countries, the highest ones that export wine and the highest, uh, the highest uh, uh, intake of wine. The U.S. is not far off the top of the list. There are a couple of European countries ahead of us, just in case you're wondering, uh, but we're not far off the top of that list. Could it be that, that as Christians, when we begin to argue for this, that we are going down that path of deception? Deception and Christians, Christians argue for this. Well, Jesus never taught that we shouldn't drink it. He just says we should drink it in moderation. So drink as much as you want, just don't get drunk. That's a very fine line, is it not? Maybe someone could say that they could potentially be playing with fire, but potentially right? Could, could it not be said that quite possibly they could be on the road to deception? And Proverbs says... If you're deceived by it, you're not wise. God says, don't miss this. Christians are to avoid drunkenness. Turn to Romans chapter number 13, if you would. Please. Romans 13. So we kind of walk through these principles just to recap and then move ahead a little bit. Romans chapter 13, the Bible says, Let us walk honestly as in the day. So kind of like a daytime activity, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. In Galatians, you don't have to turn there, Galatians 5.21, where Paul says, Envying, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have told, also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. You see, Christians are to avoid, avoid this act of drunkenness. Beyond that, Habakkuk 2.15 says this, Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that puttest thy bottle to him, and makest him drunken also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. There is an avoidance for my neighbor. And then in Proverbs 21, verse 17, The love of wine, he that loveth pleasure, shall be a poor man. He that loveth wine and oil shall not be rich. So Proverbs has gone on uh, beyond wisdom to say, listen, if you want to have an inheritance, if you want to be wealthy, you can't love wine. Interesting concept. I, I don't know that I would have, if I was writing this, tied those two concepts together, but the Lord did. And he said, listen, so I think it's not hard to see from these passages that the scripture communicates negativity about wine. Can we see that at least? Can we start there at least? Now, not going to the positive, but just the negativity. I want to go past that because the scripture clearly communicates negative examples of wine in scripture. If you would turn to 1 Samuel chapter number 1. 
1 Samuel chapter number 1. And we'll be in the scripture. We're going to be going to passages. I would encourage you to turn there. Um, I want you to see what God's word is saying. All right? Not just what, uh, as I read it, but I'd like you to see it. So 1 Samuel chapter number 1. Of course, the book of Samuel is named after the prophet Samuel. Chapter 1 is the beginning of Samuel. And uh, Samuel has a mother at this, uh, named Hannah, who is not a mother yet at this time. All right, Hannah is, is barren. Here, uh, Hannah can't bear any children. And she is distraught. All right, and she is praying and she's gone to the temple. She has, um, uh, she has pleaded with the Lord for one of these things. And she has bitterness, bitterness of soul. And she prays. And as she's praying, Eli, the priest, comes to Hannah. He sees her praying at the temple, and he sees her mouth moving, but no sound is coming out. And he's obviously distraught. He thinks that Hannah here is drunk in the temple. And he, as a priest, says, you know what, there's no place for drunkenness in the temple. I'm going to talk to this woman, and I'm going to tell her what for. That's where we pick up. That's where we pick up in, uh, in Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter number 1. Verse number 13, Now Hannah, she spake in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she had been drunken. And Eli said unto her, How long wilt thou be drunken? Put away thy, help me, wine from thee. How much was she supposed to put away? Somebody help me here. How much? He didn't say, Put away all the wine just to the point after it makes you drunk. Did he say that? No, I mean, no, he didn't say that. He said, put away thy wine from thee. So get away from it. Kind of like the expectation was don't touch it again. Did you see that? All right, let's go on. All right, I'm not drawing any conclusions yet. Let's see what the Bible says, all right? And Hannah answered, verse 15, and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink. Now, we've not looked at strong drink much yet, but in the Bible, the strong drink always refers to an alcoholic beverage, all right? Something that has been, according to the word usage, fortified, all right? This would be some hard, apparently some hard liquor. They would do some process, apparently, in the old days. I was not alive. I didn't see it, all right? And so she says, I haven't touched the strong drink, but I also haven't touched wine. But I have poured out my soul before the Lord. You see, the, the Scripture communicates a negative example because Hannah was accused of being intoxicated in the temple. This was not a good thing, right? Eli was saying, we've got to put a stop to this. You're about to worship the Lord. You shouldn't be drunk. Just like probably you, you normally shouldn't show up to church drunk. Yeah, I mean, just, just out of side note. So Pastor Scott, you taking that down? Write that down for you? Okay, good. All right. But I find it interesting that Eli would tell her to put away her wine completely, and she claims, all right, claiming that wine could have intoxicated her, I haven't drunk any of it. I haven't touched the stuff, sir. I'm just sorrowful spirit. Maybe, just maybe, that this thing that we call wine is not a good thing. Maybe it doesn't have a place in the house of God, and from Eli to the people of God, put it away. Don't bring it back. He didn't say, when you're done, when you leave. He said, put it away from you. Scripture communicates a negative example about wine. We'll go on a little bit further. Turn back to Genesis chapter number 9. Genesis chapter number 9. Genesis chapter number 9, we have the story of Noah. We've heard the story before, the account before. Noah was a righteous man. Noah was the only righteous man before the flood. He obeyed God, but after the flood, his guard wasn't up as high as it should have been. In Genesis chapter number 9, Noah was a blessed man, but in verse number 20, he began to be an husbandman, and he planted a vineyard. What was Noah's first mistake? He wasn't careful. Nothing wrong with the vineyard. God, God brought grapes in this world, not me, not you. But man 
in their flesh, always seeks to corrupt God's creation. All right, they're trying to redefine marriage, corrupt what God has created. Man always seeks to corrupt in their flesh God's creation. He made a vineyard, he drank of the wine and was drunken. Hmm. He drank of the wine and what happened? He was drunken. Now this, in this passage, could not be grape juice. I have found it medically impossible, not because I tried, because I studied this, impossible to get drunk off grape juice. All right? Medically impossible. Grape juice, by definition, has uh, 1% of a fermentation. 1% for fresh grape juice. It can, at times, go up to 2%. Where does that sit? Well, it sits right under, ready for this? A banana. And a little less than a yeast roll. Now, I used to like yeast rolls like the rest of us, but I've never seen someone get intoxicated off yeast rolls. Your body processes it faster, all right, than you can do that, all right? So, um, <laughs> some of you want to try that, though. I <laughs> throw down the yeast rolls. Wow. Very good. So he got drunk. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon their, their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. Noah w- got drunk. He got drunk and he was inappropriate in his actions. What's interesting about Genesis chapter 9 is this is the very first time this word wine is used in Scripture. Genesis chapter 9, right right here, this is where it happened right here. It's not mentioned before this point in verse number 21. In the very first mention of the word wine in Scripture. Now some people will say that the very first mention is one of the most important mentions in Scripture. I don't know that I always see that. There's probably some truth and validity to that. Uh, it's important because all scriptures give my inspiration of God, right? And so if you said at the end or the beginning, it's all important. But there's something significant, I believe, that the very first introduction to this is a negative example. It wasn't rejoicing. It was, here's what happened, here's what he did, and it was a problem. One more negative example, if we could, and flip over to Genesis chapter number 19. Genesis chapter number 19. Terrible, sad example. Genesis chapter 19, Lot has just fled Sodom and Gomorrah. Fled with his wife and two daughters. On the way out, his wife looked back. Turned into a pillar of salt. Now he's stuck in a cave, thinks the world is gone. He's stuck with his two daughters. His daughters, um, in verse number 30, Lot went up out of Zoar and dwelt in the mountain. And his two daughters with him, for he feared to dwell in Zoar. And he dwelt in a cave, he and his two daughters. And the firstborn said unto the younger, Our father is old, and there is not a man in the earth to come into us after the manner of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him that we may preserve seed of our father. And they made their father drink wine that night, and the firstborn went in and lay with her father. He perceived not when she lay down, nor when she arose. And it came to pass in the morrow that the firstborn said to the younger, Behold, I lay yesterday with my father. Let us make him drink wine this night also, and go thou in and lie with him, that we may preserve seed of our father. And they made their father drink wine that night also. And the younger arose and lay with him, and he perceived not when she lay down, nor when she arose. Thus were both the daughters of Lot with child by their father. Terrible story. Terrible. Showing the depravity, the sinfulness of man. Story is centered around what? Why? Is it not? I mean, you see it, right? The daughter, the daughter say, listen, uh, we're all alone in this world. No one else is alive. Now, we know that's not true. The earth wasn't destroyed. But in their mind, Sodom and Gomorrah, fire and brimstone rained down from heaven. All right, a catastrophic event, a supernatural God-orchestrated event. They thought this world was over. And mom now was pillar of salt. They said, oh, well, we better have children. The only way to do it is to make dad drink some wine. 
The sad thing is they knew that they could have him drink wine. They knew that it wouldn't be a problem. In fact, they said, we'll do this and tomorrow night you do this. All right, we know dad, he'll get stone cold drunk. Our plan will be flawless. And their plan succeeded because of wine. As I was studying some of these things, it is hard for me to now connect the dots with other Christians, okay, other pastors who will say, well, I enjoy, to throw, I enjoy throwing a cold one back. Studying scripture, I'm like, do you not see the depravity? Do you not see the, the, the sinfulness that happens? Do you not see what God is trying to tell us? And then you think this is a great solution to relax at the end of a hard day? One more passage to look at, Daniel chapter number 1. Daniel chapter number 1. Daniel, of course, taken into, into exile, taken from Israel, taken from his home and his family. Daniel chapter 1, verse number 8. The Bible says, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Daniel, in his heart, said, I can't defile myself even touching the king's wine. Not, don't get drunk on it. Not, moderation. Daniel said, I will not defile myself with this beverage from the king's, the king's wine. But like I mentioned last week, there's some principles that there's a paradox. There's a paradox because I think, as you can see from these passages and the other ones in some other place in Scripture, and I went through every time that wine is used in Scripture, right? There is a negativity about wine. But there's a, a paradox, a seeming apparent or, 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 or apparent contradiction, where at times it seems like the Bible doesn't talk negatively about it. It almost talks like it's a good thing. I'm like, well, this is difficult. It would seem like it would be easy for God to have very quickly solved this debate. Very easily. If he one time, two times said, don't ever touch wine. He said not to look at it. And not put the other ones in there. But I believe as we study, that it becomes a little more apparent to us. Because the Bible is not, the Bible says, of any private interpretation. It helps interpret itself. All right? And the Bible is meant to be understood. Some things will be low-hanging fruit. For instance, be ye kind one to another. Should I be kind to my younger sister? Right? Low-hanging fruit. Be ye kind. Boy, I have a bill. I don't have enough money. I'm going to worry about it. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Right? Low-hanging fruit. There's low-hanging fruit in Scripture. Those are wonderful truths. We, we love that truth. Uh, I'm afraid of what's going to happen tomorrow. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. Low-hanging fruit. And that's wonderful. But there are other times that we've got to dig a little bit deeper. We've got to take a little bit more time to say, Okay, God, what are you trying to teach us? But I want you to notice that the word for wine... In the Hebrew, yayin and oinos in Greek, in Scripture and other sources, can also mean grape juice or fermented beverage. Let me give you some example of both in here. All right, the word wine in Scripture did not necessarily have to be alcoholic. Now, this is important. Let me tell you where I'm going with this. I believe that. Scripture is negative on wine, and when it refers to that negativity, as we see in Proverbs, clearly a fermentation because there's a drunk attributes following that, right? We can clearly draw fermented wine is wrong. Other times in Scripture, I'm going to show you that it could not have been fermented. So I would argue that the times that the Bible seems to be positive about it, it's not referring to fermented beverage, or it would be contradicting itself, all right? That's where I'm going. Let me try to prove that now. Jeremiah chapter 48, verse 33. Jeremiah 48, verse 33. I'm there quicker, but I have all these things marked, all right? So I got a head start on you guys. Jeremiah 48, verse 
33. There is a prophecy going on. Jeremiah, uh, he's, he has been um, prophesying and telling what's going to happen. In verse 31, Therefore will I howl for Moab, and I will cry out for all Moab. Mine heart shall mourn for the men of Caheris. O vine of Sima, I will weep for thee with the weeping of Jazir. My plants are gone over the sea. They reach even to the sea of Jazir. The spoiler is fallen upon the summer fruits and upon thy vintage. And joy and gladness is taken from the plentiful field and from the land of Moab. And I have caused wine to fail from the wine presses. None shall tread with shouting. Their shouting shall be no shouting. Here the word wine is used in the context of someone who is treading it right from a wine press. Do you know how they got grape juice? You know? They take grapes and they crush them. In a wine press. Right? To make fermented wine, you let it sit for a while. If you take it right then, the Bible still calls it wine, all right? But it cannot be fermented at that time. See what I'm saying? All right, let me show you another passage. Isaiah chapter 16, verse 10. Isaiah 16, verse 10. Where Isaiah says, again in prophecy, And gladness is taken away, and joy out of the plentiful field, and in the vineyards there shall be no singing, neither shall be shouting. The treaders shall tread out no wine in their presses. I have made their vintage shouting to cease. So he's saying out of their presses, wine cannot even come out at that moment. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 10 says this, So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. Now some will say, anytime the Bible says new wine, that can't be alcoholic. The only problem with that is in Acts chapter number 3, uh, I think it's chapter number 3, maybe chapter number 2, at the day of Pentecost, the disciples are accused of being drunken with new wine. All right, so there is some context that new wine could be or could not be. So these drinks could, couldn't have been anything other than non-fermented. To, sh- to quote in a secular source, all right, and I think this will make sense, Aristotle, have you heard of Aristotle before? Aristotle, huge philosopher. He used, he wrote a, a huge book called Meteor- Meteorologica, and in this, and I looked it up and saw it in the Greek and the English translation, just so you know where I looked this at. He said this, there is a kind of wine, oinos is the word he uses in the Greek, for instance, which both solidifies and thickens by boiling, I mean. Really, it's not wine at all in spite of its name. It does not taste like wine and does not inebriate as ordinary wine does. Still using the word wine. Okay, so pastor, that's a lot of information. Let me clarify a little bit. One little illustration. If you go to the restaurant today, or tomorrow, you go to order a drink, and they say, you'd say, I'd like some soda, or I'd like some pop. What do you mean by that? Right? What are they going to bring you? Are they going to bring you Coke? Are they going to bring you Pepsi? Are they going to bring you Verner's? Are they going to bring you Sprite? What are they going to bring you? Well, you say, they need some more clarification because we use one term to mean a whole lot of things in here. Look at that. Look at that. I want pop. What kind of pop do you want? I don't know. Just bring me some pop. It's all the same. Well, it's not all the same. I like Diet Coke. And Diet Pepsi is not all the same. All right? I don't know who invented Diet Pepsi, but it was after the Garden of Eden, that's for sure. That's all I know. And this word, wine, yayin, Y-A-Y-I-N in Hebrew, oinos in the Greek, could mean by secular writing and scripture writing, it could mean a whole bunch of things, from fermented to grape juice in there. To some writings, said it could also, the word wine, could refer to jelly and jam. There was the wine of, was it, uh, well, I forget now, Madagascar, but somewhere in there, there's some wine of some country that was like a thick jam that they would do. They called it wine, the same thing. You ain't drinking that. 
They would use this same word wine. But what happens is now in 2020, we can back and say, oh, well, the Bible just says wine, not taking the whole context of Scripture, understanding how that word was used, and trying to apply it to a very thin dynamic now. And saying, obviously, the Bible says it's good for wine. So you know what? I'm going down to Liquor King and I'm buying me whatever I want. Say, whoa, whoa, whoa. So possible scenarios here. Number one, number one scenario, I don't believe this, but maybe God doesn't know what he's talking about. Maybe God got confused in Scripture. All right? Possible scenario, right? Possible? Absolutely not possible. God did not get confused. All right? Um, God, someone will say, well, wine is different now. All right? And that's why God used to be for it, but now he's against it. All right? So does God change? Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Well, maybe God has two personalities. And sometimes he's against fermented wine, and sometimes he's not. Well, that's not true either. Because what I find is this, that God tells us to avoid wine that brings about drunk characteristics, is against behavior that comes from drinking wine, and cautions us not to be deceived by it. Synopsis. Scripture is against wine, against the effects of wine, and shows us how the word is used in Scripture. So I think it's pretty clear, I think it's clear from Scripture, that we've got to stay away from wine as a Christian. Now, it's 7.56. I wanted to get tonight to some of the problems of Scripture. Right? Let me just... I'll give you a brief overview. I'm not going to answer the questions yet. But here's what I want to answer when we come back to it. Why did Paul tell Timothy to drink a little wine for the stomach's sake? Problem passage. All right? Why did... But why did Jesus... What did he turn when he turned water into wine? What was that? What does it mean when they said Jesus was a wine bibber? Look at that. Jesus drunk. Or Jesus drank. <laughs> drunk. Jesus drank. What does it mean when, uh, when it says to give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish? What does that mean? And then, what does it mean from 2,100 years ago? So I don't have time tonight to jump into the problems, but next week we'll deal with the problems. All right, fair enough? Fair enough, next week. So I think it's clear from Scripture. If you have a question... I think they have that number for the screen. Submit a question. Say, Pastor, this didn't make sense. Why do you think this? And uh, I believe Scripture answers itself. And I believe a Christian ought to stay away from wine as an alcoholic beverage. All right? And if I ever say something different, then kick me out of here. All right? I'm, I'm, I know. I, uh, besides in jest, right, of course. Um, but it's, I don't think there's room for that. And I, it still boggles my mind. That, uh, that we have pastors who argue for that. All right? Um, aside the fact that we see broken lives, broken homes, broken families. Forget that. Just read your Bible. All right? Lord, thank you for loving us. Lord, help us to look to you for our instruction, for our reason and way to live. Lord, we sure love you. And Lord, thank you for what you're doing for us. In Jesus' name, amen.